Good evening, folks. This is Greg Judy at Green Pastures Farm with my wife, Jan. And uh, tonight's topic is random questions that have been uh, submitted by you folks on our YouTube channel. And Jan goes through there and kind of picks out some of the, the better, dicier ones that uh, she's going she's gonna to fire them at me tonight. Yeah. So, and we're going to discuss them. She'll have things to comment right. on them, too. So, yeah. Jan, what's, yeah. what's your question? Yeah. And he doesn't know what he's getting, folks. It's just kind of... Yeah. Um, so, uh, we've been doing a lot of brush brush piles and things like that. People, someone wants to know, how do you make a rabbit hat? You've talked about that several times. Okay, so how do you make a rabbit hat brush pile? Um, so, you've got to build the base. The base is extremely important. You need logs that are 10 to 12 inches in diameter. Uh, they can be bigger than that, but they need to be a minimum of 10 inches. And it takes three of them, and you stack them side by side, and then you put like a six inch spacer between them. So they need to be about four to six inches apart. And when I say apart, I mean talking like here's one, here's one, and here's one. So lengthwise, and they, uh, they need to be eight feet, a minimum of eight feet long. And so once you get your logs, your three base logs stacked on the ground, you take some old tin. Uh, it can just be metal roofing off an old barn. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, brand new tin. Just find you some corrugated metal and lay that down lengthways over those logs so that you're building a roof, a weatherproof roof over the top of those big logs. And what that does, it, it shields the, the critters, the, the small animals, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, rabbits or whatever, it gets in there, mice. They need a dry place. Even songbirds and things will use these, these rabbit hats. And then over the top of that uh, corrugated metal, you build a big old brush pile. I mean, a big one. Get cedars or, you know, any kind of wasted wood products. You just build you a big brush pile over the top. But how tall? What's the minimum? Oh, well, I'd like, I like mine to be, you know, the thing is they will settle over time. So you need to get probably six foot, six to seven foot built on top of those logs. But the key is that metal roofing that protects that base and those logs don't get wet. And they're going to last a long time because they're not getting hammered by rain and rot and stuff. Oh, and place them, you need to place them oh, about, yeah. about 50 foot apart because a rabbit can actually outrun a coyote for about 50 feet. After that, he's toast. And so you want to place these rabbit tats where the, the rabbit can, can get around from one rabbit tat to the next without getting caught, and so he can reproduce. So a, a lot of times, Greg, you'll build them between two trees. Yep. Not just out in the middle of a field. Right. Oh, yeah. You've got to have habitat. And you can't just put it out in the middle of a fescue field and expect to have rabbits. You've got to have some briars. You need to have some brush and some brambles around. That's what rabbits need. They, they can't make it on just pure pasture. Okay. Just yet, because that's another thing. That's I, I'll, I'll finish up. I know I'm going to get uh, a lot of uh, comments from you Auss Aussies out there. You all are ate up with rabbits. And <laughs> for us to be sitting here in America talking about, well, we kind of like to have a few rabbits around. It's different. I mean, we don't have rabbits uh, eating us out of house and home like you all do, like you folks right. do. And, so, and also, um, it gives the uh, bobcats, the coyotes, the, the hawks, the eagles, yep. um, something, something to else. Eat. Something to eat. Yeah, something yep. other than sheep. Yep. Okay. So, we're going to go on to trees. Or you want to... Did you have something else? Nope. Okay. Um, why do you leave cedars while other farmers clear them out? Um, and could could you just thin them out? I don't know why they put that in there, but that was in there. Well, cedars, we have some uh, pretty good-sized cedar groves on our farms. And the cedar groves are worth their weight in gold in the wintertime. When you get down, you know, 10, 20, 30 below zero, and the snow's coming down, and I mean, you have a blizzard, basically. If you've got a cedar grove, and those cows can get in that cedar grove, it's just, it's like a giant outdoor barn. It's comfortable in there. And they've done a lot of studies showing that it's, you know, 10 to 20 degrees warmer underneath the cedar tree than it is standing out in the open. So they're extremely good cover. They do catch the rain. 
they catch the snow. I mean, the ground underneath a big cedar tree will a lot of times be bare. There's no snow on the ground because all the snow's up in the tree. Uh, we just got through it's, getting It's a, just like an umbrella. It's a big umbrella. Like that's yep. collapsed, but not totally. We just got six inches on Saturday, and we had cedar trees around here that were bent completely over with the weight of the snow. I thought they were going to... Well, it did snap a few of them, but they're they're really good. I mean, they're... they're they make a good, comfortable place for a large, or for any kind of herd of animals, whether it's sheep or goats or deer. cows. Deer, absolutely. I saw coming home the other day, uh, a lot of deer coming out from underneath there because the sun had kind of popped out. And, yep. And that. Um, so we like cedars. I just don't want them up in the middle of my pasture. Um, they kill out the grass. You know, the needles fall off and turn into the ground acidic. And acid soil is pretty tough to grow good forage. And and you do go out sometimes and thin them. I do. So, yep. and um, um, we don't know why some of the other farmers clear cut them, but they don't, I guess they don't see the value in them. I guess. Okay. So, if you lose a lease, can the timeless fence be pulled up and reinstalled in a different location? And how would you do that? Yeah, so if you lose a lease, first of all, on, on leasing land, if you never lease land without a written contract. And on that written contract, you need to stipulate who owns what. And so if the landowner's not interested in putting in fence and he doesn't have any fence, but yet he's agreed to let you uh, lease it to graze livestock, well, then that's your deal. You've got to come up with the money and the, and the materials or the know-how to get that fence put in. And so that's your fence. You need to make sure that's on the lease. At the end of the lease, it's yours. You take that with you. And that means rolling up the high tensile wire, which that's easy. You just roll it up on a spinning jenny. Um, and also the, the post, timeless post, all you need is a, a log chain. Uh, or they make jacks. You can just jack them out of the ground. They make these T-post jacks. And see, the, that's the beautiful thing about uh, uh, the timeless. Yes. It's shaped like a T, and so those T post uh, pullers, they just yeah, they're pull, not yeah, pull them right out. Yep. And they're, I, I and, love I love timeless fence. And, I mean, it's a great it's a great post. And are they easy to reinstall? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just use a, a steel post driver and slap them in the ground. I mean, yeah. because it's, they've not been damaged. And you know, well, no, you don't damage them. You don't. You're not chipping the paint off. The the the, the product is made with the UV inhibitor built into the post. That's what I like about them. So when you drive them in the ground or you pull them out or you handle them, you're not chipping the outside paint on those posts. And that's huge because, you know, the UV is your biggest enemy of any post. Uh, fiberglass or whatever you're using, is, it can work on that surface. And once you lose that, uh, it, it can go south pretty quick. Okay, so here's um, someone texted me this and and we've been I've been getting a lot of questions for the uh, sheep sales um, I I bought a ram for my use to breed and it, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and after they breed with this ram do I have to get rid of that ram um, so that he doesn't then breed his, his offsprings um, and uh, the guy that I bought the ram from said he can breed his daughters and granddaughters but what about the the rams that are born after, after you know his sons? His sons. So, yeah. and and could you address that? I get that question a lot. Yeah. So you can breed. I mean, line breeding is basically breeding back the sire to his daughters, granddaughters, great granddaughters, and we've been doing that for years with no issues at all. Uh, where you where you could get into trouble is keeping a a son. And breeding him right back to his mother. Um, that's the true definition of an inbreeding. And I'm not saying it hasn't happened on our farm. It probably has. Um, but I, I wouldn't go out of my way to do that. I mean, we have enough sheep and we have other people's right. flocks now that are producing our type of sheep. Uh, we, we try and bring some of those rams in and mix them in with ours. So we're getting more, you know. Cross genetics. Yeah, more homogeneous, you might say. Not just one one brand of sheep, you know, one brand of ram. Yeah. So it is okay then to keep that one, that initial ram yep. and breed it 
to the daughters and granddaughters. Absolutely, absolutely. And how long would you keep that ram then? Well, I mean, you know, when a ram gets mature, uh, a young ram, let's just say he was born in May, and you turn him into a use in December, he's he's plenty old enough to breed. He will, he'll breed them. Uh, but you don't want to put much more than probably 20 to 25 ewes on him. He, he isn't, he's only seven months old. Now, when they get up to a year and a half, two years old, that ram can breed a lot of ewes. Uh, you know, there was a guy uh, talked about, well, William was here from England. Mm -hmm. He said a guy bred, a, was it 150? I think, that, I think that's what he said. Yeah, it was 100, 120, 150 ewes with one ram. An now, older ram. An older ram. But he said he wouldn't do it again. It was pretty hard on him. And that's the one thing that I would caution you about is you're turning, now we're talking about Missouri. You turn the ram in December 1st for May 1st, green pasture lambing, warm temperatures. If you put a lot of use on one ram, trying to save money from not having to have two rams, let's say you put you know, 70, 80 use on one ram, and he could do it, but that ram's gonna get thin on you. And what's he in? He's in December. He's got all the winter looking at him. And if you're not careful, he'll get thin enough, you might lose that ram over the winter time. And so, or he may not get them all bred. So you don't want barren ewes, uh, a ewe that didn't get bred because the ram just gave out and couldn't get them all bred. So, you know, uh, just having all your she all your ewes bred to giving you twins, you can't afford not to get them all bred. So, you know, you got to separate that ram out anyway. He's going to be a lot happier if he's got a buddy with him. If you got to put him by himself all summer long, basically when I say all summer, I'm talking in Missouri from July to December. You can't have that ram around your ewes. If you do, it's going to be a wreck. He's going to find those ewes. I don't care what you got him in, uh, other than a ram, the a uh, rambler, lamb, the Lamborghini. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Lamborghini. Um, it's a, well, that's another topic. Okay. Cool. Do, you, do you want to wrap it up? Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and stop with that. You got, you got one more question? Oh, I have lots of questions. Let's just give them one more. Okay. Um, and, well, we already answered that. Um, cross that one off. Cross that one off. <laughs> okay. Um, how many acres, how many acres will our sheep cover in a year? And that's, yeah. yeah. And and now, and how many sheep? So, talk about the sheep when they land well, and all that, too. Yeah, so that, that's a tough question because on our sheep pastures, the, the cows are using those as well. So, that, that, that's kind of a tough one to answer. But basically, I'll, I'll just answer it this way. Let's just say you've got 50 acres and you know that you can run... Yeah, let's just do three, uh, three times uh, 14. Yeah, you could run 13 to 14 cows on there. If you have good grass cover. Yeah, so for every cow, just pencil in five ewes. So if, you, if you're running, let's do the math on 15. You run 15 cows, you sold all the cows, you just say you want to go all sheep, you can do five ewes for every one of those cows. So that's going to be, what, 75? Mm-hmm. Yep. You can run 75 ewes. So those 75 ewes are going to consume the same amount of grass as those 15 cows. But now 75 ewes, if you could average uh, 1.7 to 1.8 lambs per ewe, whew, you're going to knock a home run. I mean, that's, folks, the, the, lamb, the lamb market has just absolutely exploded. And I don't know how long it's going to be like that, but it's... They're getting prices for lamb that I've never seen in my lifetime, mm, right, right yeah. now. And uh, there's rumors it's going higher. So who knows? But right now, it's their darn good property to have, I can tell you that. So, yep. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Uh, hit that subscribe button and the like button on the way out and check out our grazing school. Uh, the beginning grazer school is starting to fill up. It's um, about three-fourths the way full. Yep, and we've had it up, what, two and a half, three weeks? Since, like, January 2nd. Yep, so, and the, the Advanced Grazing School is, is going that way, too. So go to our website, greenpasturesfarm.net, and you can sign up there. We are having problems with PayPal buttons. Just 
email us. We'll work through it, and yeah. we can go from there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, have a good evening, folks. Take care now.